Catherine, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, it's also super interesting that you made the time because you have a 10-week-old baby at home. I do, yeah. What's that like to be one of the rare women in the mining industry, young, leading the organization, and a 10-month-old baby? 10-week-old baby. 10-week-old baby. 10 weeks. Yes, uh, stressful. Um, no, it... Uh, it's been quite entertaining, actually, uh, really only in so that. far as um, the chaps I work with have absolutely no experience with dealing with the issues associated with being pregnant and growing in size and not knowing whether to comment on it or not and uh, maternity leave and not, you know, because, because I've got to the point where I'm management, I've not just switched off. You know, I, I, I've not disappeared, but at the same time, I'm not going into the office every day. I've just had a baby. So, so balancing that. Now, luckily, I had my first child um, when I just joined Barrick, as, um, and I had a sort of non-role, I'd describe it. So there was some experience of how I was going to stay attached, stay in touch. But yes, the, um, the last few weeks have been entertaining only in so far as these chaps are desperately trying very hard to be helpful and accommodating, but with no experience, keep asking me whether they're doing a good job. Don't you like it when men do that? That's genius. Um, but you've also taken a bit of a different trajectory of joining the mining industry because you're only 38, but you are chief operating officer, you had the role of CFO, um, and the journey has been very different to many of the men in your organization. Mm -hmm. How did you skip the line? <laughs> Well, I, I, I use my brain, I think. Uh, well, so I, I was a geologist originally, so I, I, I studied natural sciences at Cambridge, specialized in geology, did a mining finance master's, uh, thinking I'd go into sort of evaluations in the mining industry. A combination of not wanting to go out to the middle of nowhere and do my three years in the field in order to get back to the office, which was the normal route as well as being the bottom of the last commodity cycle. So it was just after the dot-com bubble, 2002, 2003. Uh, I went to work for Merrill Lynch instead of going to work for Anglo-American, which were my two options. And so luckily, over the next decade, we had this huge commodities boom. I was a, big, a portfolio manager, um, ended up being co-manager of the largest mining fund in the world. Um, got me huge amounts of profile, got me a lot of experience very quickly. Uh, which then meant I could effectively, as you say, leapfrog and, and get myself into a position where my background and my expertise is around strategy, around finance, around investors. It's a very different angle to the typical mining route. And at the time, the new chairman was looking for new blood, looking to change the behavior of mining. And, and that's a lot of what we're going to talk about, actually trying to change the way the mining industry behaves. And I, I suppose, to a certain extent, epitomize that, having me up there. Not only do I think differently, I look differently, I sound different. It, it just you know, created an opportunity that, for me, was too, too good to pass up. So talk us through the strategy, because that's quite important. When we, when we look at gold, it's always been the standard. Um, how important in your eyes, as you look at technology and all of the changes and geopolitics and tensions, how important has gold become um, in, in, in this time? Um, is it still, is it relevant? Is it coming back? Where is it at? Well, it's fascinating, gold. Everyone always says it's a barbarous relic. In fact, that's Keynes who said it was a barbarous relic. When was that? A hundred years ago, if not more. Um, that it's somehow going to lose its um, uh, glitter, glister, as Shakespeare would say. The thing is, is it, it always comes back to being that store of value. Now, I brought a prop with me. Oh, she's got a prop. Uh, this I is a pet. Um, to illustrate the point, which is, here is... Uh, a note from a country. It's the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, and it's a $100 trillion note. And what I, uh, this illustrates is just the danger of fiat currency, of paper money, and the danger of people trying to manipulate currencies in order to get themselves out of the problems that they face. Now, today and over the last decade, we've seen a huge amount of that quantitative easing, uh, debt crises, we've seen interest rates being cut, this manipulation of currencies in order to solve human problems. 
the thing about gold is the only way you can get more gold is to dig it up. So on the whole, gold supply increases by no more than 2% per annum. And what that does is it means its value is very tangible. And, it, and literally it's tangible in that to hold a bar of gold, you feel the weight of it. And so for, 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 for centuries, for, for thousands of years, that has had value. And, and we can see today with gold having rallied very rapidly from 1200 to 1500, whether it's trade wars with China, uh, whether it's uh, you know, the drones attacking a Saudi um, oil uh, refinery, whether it's um, currency manipulation, and in particular, interest rate rises or interest rate cuts. So now we're looking at a weaker economy and interest rates cuts in the US. What people do is go to safe havens, and gold is the epitome of safe haven. Uh, and so, yes, this, this keeps me sane. So whenever someone tells me that cryptocurrencies are going to take the place of gold, I look at this and I realize that I would still rather have my gold sovereigns hidden away that I can pass on to next generations, that are mobile, that can come with me wherever I go, that will be forever uh, fungible into any currency than ever trust uh, paper. If anyone wants to see what a hundred trillion dollars looks like in Zimbabwe, please do catch Catherine That's as she's ahead. leaving. Um, here comes the question about technology then, because it's gold is gold at the end of the day. It comes mm -hmm. down to mining, it comes down to human beings in those mines, and yeah. technology is playing that big part. How does AI, how does digitalization change the very way gold functions for you as a company, as a product, and then how does it impact the workforce? How are you implementing it at this point? Well, the main thing really is around, um, well, there are three areas that, that technology is really gonna help. Um, gold mining in particular, but mining in general. So the first thing, as a commodity business, you can't really change your revenue line. I speak as a former CFO, so you don't have the flexibility that a lot of other companies have, which is you, you evolve or change your revenue line to be able to increase profits. So everything is always around costs, uh, or it's around producing more. And so technology and AI in particular uh, provide us the opportunity to prevent the margin erosion that we're currently seeing. So we're seeing taxes increase, we're seeing the environmental cost, the social cost of mining going up. We're seeing uh, huge pressures on the mining industry in general. So when you look at the opportunity of automation, taking people out, um, when you look at the opportunities of AI to um, uh, stop mining being linear, to actually being able to react in milliseconds rather than days to things and improve efficiencies, they're all ways of protecting your margin over time. The second thing which I think is most important is, is around the changing nature of the workforce. One is that the safety element of mining, it's a dangerous job mining, unfortunately, particularly when you're underground. And so by being able to remove people from that danger, particularly the face of underground where you've got seismic activity, you have the potential for rockfall instance, but also trucks moving around. We had a terrible accident the other day um, with uh, a bus um, uh, having an accident on the road, just trucking people to work. You're always gonna be at risk. Um, and so by automating, uh, what you do is remove some of that. And, and the workforce also is changing. So if I look at the demographic in uh, Nevada, which is, is under my domain, uh, the average age is 47. So 50% of your working population is over 47. And the challenge we've got over the next 20 years is they're all gonna be retiring. And what we don't have is a huge amount of uh, young blood coming into the industry. Uh, and we have to attract that young blood. We have to make mining somewhere they want to go to, somewhere cutting edge, somewhere that's going to be full of opportunity, rather than people fearing that it's the same old drudgery, that job cuts whenever the commodity price goes down. How do you do that with automation? Because therein lies the, the, the fear that you won't have the talent that wants to do the job. But then with technology and AI, you have um, sexier fields to go into um, as, com as competitors. People would rather work at an electric car company than be doing, dealing with mining, perhaps. How do, you, how do you win that battle when you are implementing the technology? Well, it's a PR field? battle, in fact. Yeah. Um, because the application of those technologies to mining is just important. Effectively, what we're changing is we're taking the truck drivers and turning them into data analysts. Uh, we're taking the um, mining engineers uh, and, and 
making them AI specialists. Uh, and so these, it's changing the nature of our business. And so that's the, also the big um, pressure in terms of communicating to communities and to governments. It's not about taking jobs away. It's about changing the nature of the jobs and making them much more transferable skills. So the biggest challenge we have is in northern Nevada, you're in Elko, you've got a small population. You want to be able to offer them opportunities. That means they don't have to leave that town. And if you can provide them with those kind of high-tech skills in the local college, Great Basin College, well, then the, the whole approach to the business and to the industry is going to change. And so, so yes, for us, it is very much taking um, what were, I suppose, old world skills and, and retraining or bringing in new blood and, and turning them into the electric car company of the future. In fact, Tesla is based now in northern Nevada, too. So uh, we're able convenient to, approach. to change, yeah. Um, questions from everyone in the room. There's one at the back. Thank you so much. Scotty Greenwood, Canadian American Business Council. Uh, the immediate past chair of our board, still a board member, is Christina Erling from Barrick. So uh, wonderful company, great investor in uh, public policy, Canada, US. Uh, but I just texted Christina, because we have a board meeting here in Toronto tomorrow, and I said, are you here? Your COO is speaking at this uh, Fortune conference. And she said, no, she's not. She's on maternity leave. And I said, she's here. <laughs> and uh, we agreed, uh, how kick-ass. So anyway, Christina sends her best. And I should have told Christina here. I was here, yes. It's okay. <laughs> thank you. And she's doing a great job, by the way. And she, she is. commutes to Elko from Washington, D.C., which is a heck of a commute. But anyway, thank you. No, and I think the other thing that highlights is the importance of building um, a team around you. So, so Christina's government relations for North America, both U.S. and Canada. And so my ability to step away, I had no qualms doing that because I've got that team around me to do it. Uh, and, and that is, I think, the most important thing uh, around, um, particularly in the mining industry, is creating that support network that means you don't feel guilty, you don't feel um, bad for not being there all the time. Uh, and it provides people opportunity as well. Um, any other questions in the room? Hi, Jennifer Flanagan from Actua. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to any initiatives that Barrick is doing to invest in that workforce of the, the future. So you talked about reskilling, but are you doing any long-term planning to, to bolster that workforce? Yeah, so, so Great Basin College, the reason I mentioned them, uh, which is the sort of local tertiary college in, in uh, Elko, uh, we've partnered with them effectively to, to, to create the, the core skills that we're looking for in the future. Um, so we've got it both on the electri electrician side of it for, for manual skills, but also data analytical skills to bring it in locally. Uh, and then what we're doing is, is uh, we've tried both successfully and unsuccessfully over the last sort of two or three years, is partnering with um, smaller companies. Uh, so one is automation um, driverless trucks in Nevada. We've got... Uh, uh, we couldn't get any of the big um, manufacturers, Caterpillar, Sandvik, to engage. And so what we've done is we've partnered with some smaller outfits really to try and uh, customize it to apply to the technology that we have on site rather than having to buy brand new. So those are the two areas in particular. And then the final thing is we're actually introducing a graduate scheme. We've never really had a proper graduate scheme because of this boom-bust nature of mining industry. You hire when you can and you, you let people go when you can't. And it's that lack of consistency, that lack of longevity that I think has really held the mining industry back over the years. It would be great if we had time to talk more about the responsible mining uh, agreement that you have been part of, but we have pretty much run out of time, but we would probably get into it if you can grab her on the way out as she runs back to her 10-week-old baby. <laughs> so thank you very much, Catherine, thank for you. joining us. And it's been great having you.